how has your life been different than what you thought it was going to be? I thought that my life was probably not one that was going to be worth living. There was this hole that I had all of my life because I never thought I'd be able to walk along the beach and hold somebody's hand because I'm gay. But, you know, when I fell in love with my mommy, I knew that she was my soulmate. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah. I had never felt that way about anyone before. And um, after she had gotten her divorce from Grandpa Jim, she was very upfront with your mom. She told your mom she was in love and it was with a woman. And that was the first time that anyone was proud to say that they loved me. That made me the happiest I'd ever been in my life. And then when I got to know your mom and Uncle Justin, I knew that I had hit paradise because I now have a family that I can wrap my arms around. Is there anything that you've never told me that you want to tell me now? You know, you and I talk about most things, but this is the first time that we've ever talked about the fact that I'm gay. And I guess what I want to ask you is, does it embarrass you to have a gay grandma? No. No. It doesn't really matter because <laughs> it just matters my relationship with you. I always tell you how much I love you but I don't know that you can really understand the depth of it because you're someone that I never thought would be in my life and I can't imagine my life without you. You have always been a child that makes up her own mind and I am so, so proud of you. Well, um, you're one of my favorite grandmas. You do like a lot of things with me, like ride roller coasters and <laughs> play poker. <laughs> I don't know what life would be like without you here. Uh, I love you, sweetheart. Love you, too. Well, good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you. I am so happy you are able to join us this evening on June 10th as we get ready to explore some really cool, fun Arizona history. Oh, my gosh. We're going to have so much fun. All right. So I want to welcome you all. Now, I know some of you are watching um, on Facebook. There are also a few watching on YouTube and even Twitch which is more for kind of the younger generation watching other folks play video games. So why not having them play and learn some Arizona history as well? So today is June 10th. And so it's kind of a unique day. I mean, there's all kinds of things going on. Um, so on this date, back in 1903, after two hours of torrential rain, Clifton, Arizona, a little mining town over on the border of Arizona, New Mexico, kind of over in that area, they had so much water. 11 people were known to have drowned. And the photo that we have here is really just kind of showing, let's make it a little bit bigger. So it's just showing some of the aftermath of that flood. Um, it is Ash also National Ball Pen Day, Ballpoint Pen Day. Now you might wonder why are we celebrating ballpoint pens on June 10th? Because that is back in 1943, the patent was given for the first ballpoint pen that wrote smoothly, had an easy way for the ink to get onto the paper. And so before that, people used to use fountain pens. And, you know, fountain pens, 
I tried using them here in the desert and they dry out so quickly that, you know, you kind of lose the thrill of writing with a fountain pen quite quickly here in the desert. Um, it is also National Herbs and Spice Day. You know, as our temperatures outside are heating up, you can have all kinds of amazing herbs as you grill out, um, celebrating all kinds of also international or global cuisine. I mean, I know right down the street from me, I have really good Ethiopian and Middle Eastern. So I know I will be hitting them up over the summer. So that way I don't have to heat up my kitchen. So what can you expect tonight with Marshall Shore, Arizona hip historian? Well, you know, this is going to be an amazing show. We, of course, have trivia with a very special guest. We'll get to that in a moment. We also have some fun facts about a little Arizona town that we call Little Arizona. There is also show and tell because, as you can see, I've got a house full of stuff. And we also always do a little bit of music history. And so tonight it's actually on theme for what we're going to be talking about. And of course, we have a cocktail. So in case this is your first time here, my name is Marshall Shore. I'm also known as the Hip Historian. Now, I got here a little over 21 years ago. Uh, I was working in a library in Brooklyn. And a, an amazing little Carnegie, well, actually not a little Carnegie, a big Carnegie, because Carnegie didn't build little libraries. And so traded that for a library in South Phoenix, where there was a rich oral tradition of kind of how the community evolved. And I quickly realized that not a lot of people were talking about how that community evolved or other communities. So it was really an opportunity to kind of just get a chance to just talk to people and gather their history and talk about it in a different way. And then to do that, we had to load everything into a U-Haul and, you know, we got here and promptly moved into a beautiful 1956 ranch. Now, when we moved in, it was oh so many tones of beige inside and out. I'm happy to say outside, it is just two tones. Seafoam and cantaloupe. Now, there's my kitchen looks like today. All that buttercream yellow tile, matching yellow in the wall oven, matching stove top with push buttons set in the wall. So our house is pretty much a time capsule. Now, as soon as I got here, all I kept hearing people say that there was no history here. And I knew that wasn't true because every time I would go for an adventure, whether it was close by or far, I was on foot on a bike in a car. It didn't matter. I kept running across so many amazing people, places, and stories. And so that's one of the things that really spurned me to really do this. And then that post-war boom that I think in oh so many ways made the Arizona that we all know and love today. All those GIs that either were stationed here, trained here, or passed through on the way to somewhere else. And after the war, they were moving here in huge numbers. And in some cases, looking for a house just like mine. Now, to become the hip historian, you know, I've done a variety of things. Why, just a little this week, I was out in Scottsdale talking to Rotary Club out there. That was a lot of fun. It was actually the first time I had been in front of a group larger than I would say three, probably in well over a year. So that was a lot of fun. We had some great chats about signage, all kinds of fun things. Um, this week has been kind of interesting. Um, Scottsdale Republic, which is an incident of the Arizona Republic over the weekend, as well as then today, the Arizona Republic, um, they published images and stories from a project that I actually did with the Cronkite School of Journalism, where we went around the valley and talked about several different spots and kind of what was important about them, a little bit about their history. And it's talking about how we were at Greenwood Cemetery and we talked about Nikolai Duralin, who is a gender pioneer from 1906, who passed away here. And so it launches into his story. Um, I guess I can also add to my title. 
um, I am now Emmy nominated for that video series that we did. So intrigued, I guess we'll find out coming sometime September whether we actually get a golden, uh, an Emmy or something, who knows, kind of exciting just to be nominated. So very thrilled about that. Also, um, this week we did a storytelling project with the Bisbee Library, with a the Copper Queen Library down in Bisbee, Arizona, which has won, um, 2019, won Best Small Town Library in the U.S., which is kind of cool. And so then coming up next week, we are doing LGBTQ history in Arizona. Um, that's going to be a virtual program. If anybody would like to attend that, let me know, and we can figure out how to get you there. Um, also, um, early next week, I'm sitting down with the folks from Arizona Central. They are they do a really cool podcast, if you haven't checked it out, called Valley 101. And so I've talked with them about a variety of subjects. So this is going to be fun as well. And you can go on and listen to their kind of backstock of all the different programs they've done, which are really interesting and really well done. Now, if you would like to reach out, you can feel free to do so, whether it's on Facebook, Instagram, email. I always love to hear people because, you know, that's actually where I get my best stories from is people sharing their stories. And that's really the reason why I started doing this because over a year ago, I realized I was sitting in my house by myself and nobody was listening to me and I was listening to no one. There was no sharing going on. So that's what a lot of tonight is about, is about sharing fun Arizona history. And that's why I ask if you know, then you'll know you should click on share because this is going to be an amazing show. Oh my gosh, we kind of bounce around to so many different topics, but that's kind of the beauty of it. So right now we're gonna talk about Little Arizona. Now I know I mentioned that I moved from New York, but I grew up in a small rural farm town in kind of Midwest Indiana, right in the middle of the state. And growing up in a small town, I kind of have an affinity for those little quirky communities. And so tonight we are gonna talk about Cleeter, Arizona. So if you've ever been up the 17, you've driven right by it. Now to get to it, you've got to get on this little dirt road off the 17. And, you know, it's one of those towns that people say is a ghost town, but, you know, there are a handful of folks that live in the area. Now, the address for it actually is Mayor, but I still like to think they all live in Cleeter. And as of last, what we could tell was it looks like there are about 11 people who live in Cleeter, Arizona. Now, it was known as Cleeter in 1925 when James P. Cleeter actually took it over. Now, one of the things I think is interesting, well, you know, this is just me geeking out, is looking it up, of course, in my favorite book. Eh, there we go. Arizona Place Names by Barnes. He says that it actually it was the it was James Cleeter with an E. It was E R, not O R. And that over time, that has just kind of been sanitized over that. Originally, it was called Turkey Creek. So Cleeter took it. Before that, it was Turkey Creek because it was near Turkey Creek. And it was mining. So that's what was going on there. Um, in the early 1900s, it also had a railroad running right through the middle of it, which was Murphy's Impossible Railroad, which was going up into the Bradshaw Mountains. And that's how they made it feasible to build this with all these switchbacks, this train that would get to the top of the mountain in a very short distance. So it then became cheaper to bring that gold down or that other precious minerals that they were working on. Now by 1932 that train was that train tracks were removed and so the road that gets you to Crown King is indeed that old road that follows. That's why it takes you almost as long to get from the I-17 over oh there's also a Turkey Creek in Choquise, er, Cochise County. Interesting. 
you know, a lot of times places also had to change their name because it was a duplicate name and mail would wind up going to the wrong place. So, but I mean, you can still see if you go to Cleeter, it's very much got that mining feel to it. As you can still see bits of those mines still hanging around. I mean, here we actually have Mr. Cleeter. As well as there's what the town looks like. Now, you might think, you know, this looks like a place where you would have a yacht club. If that was your guess, then you are indeed right. Because they have a fake yacht club where they have some boats that they've gathered up and have set down. And so that's what they do is you can sit up there on the porch and have a cocktail. Well, I think as long as it's beer, I think that's all the bar really serves. Um, when I, I when I was out in Crown King, I stopped on the way going and the bar was packed. All six seats of the bar were taken. So I decided to wait till I came back. And then when I walked in, the guy behind the bar was like, hey, you were just in here the other day. And indeed I was, but I was able to sit down there and have a beer and enjoy the company of all the other folks. It was also, they filmed a really a, a horror film. We'll just say that. And it is indeed a true horror film. It has lots of blood and gore. I've only been able to make it through a little bit of the trailer. So I'm not going to torture any of you by showing that. But if you like blood and gore, you might want to go on and check out the movie Sickle. I think it's actually on YouTube. And if you have some spare change, you could buy Cleeter. It could be yours. You could even change the name to your name if you would like to have a town here in Arizona named after you. So that is always an option. Um, I know it went for up for sale pre-COVID, and I think it is still up for sale. The price has dropped. It's now under a million dollars. So... If you've got a little bit of money burning hole in your pocket, here you go. You could preserve some really cool history. Now, also, because it is happy hour, I am happy to say PJ has, again, come up with a great tasty cocktail. And so tonight it is called the Dreamy Draw Dram. It, <laughs> try and say that after a couple of the Dreamy Draw Drams. A nice little tongue twister. So it's got a little bit of Eagle Rare Bourbon. St. Elizabeth Allspice Dram. A little bit of lemon juice. Some aromatic bitters and some raw sugar cane. And so it is something that is just really delightful on a summer day. And let's see if... Oh, there we go. And so PJ makes it really easy. All I have to do is it comes in a great little mason jar. And there we go. We have a delightful dreamy draw dram. Oh, and that is very nice for a summer day. So, super tasty. Now, through the miracle of modern technology, let's see what's it going on. Because Stephen just dropped off. So, oh, and there he is. Perfect timing. All right. So let's see. So we have Stephen Butler coming on to the screen. Oops. Oh, and we'll take me that off. We'll do that. There we go. Oh Hello. Hello. Hello, Marshall. I am so happy to see you. It has been so long since we've had a chance to sit down and chat. I know this, this is such an honor. And I just want to say as somebody who was, who was raised on Sesame street and Mr. Rogers neighborhood, I feel I've finally arrived because there's a, there's a puppet 
on this show. I feel like there's this full circle thing happening here in addition to just wonderful Marshall. So. Well, and so what's really cool, so the silent bartender um, is actually made by my friend Stacy, who is local, who is a puppeteer on Sesame Street. Oh, even better. Yeah. So, and I think she was actually in the Arizona Republic today talking about her midlife crisis. And now she has created a puppet food truck that is going to basically only have, it's going to be like a program puppet mobile. And you can also get puppet shaped treats. Actually, no, tr tr puppets shaped like treats. So like a sandwich puppet, maybe some ice cream puppets. I, I, I want I want all of that right now. So <laughs> exactly. Everything you just said, I want to be part of it. <laughs> oh, okay. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, my name is Stephen Butler, and um, I am born and raised in Arizona. And uh, I'm very proud of that fact. And um, yeah, so I, I have a, a few different hats I wear. I'm executive director for um, uh, a nonprofit uh, called the Compassion Institute, which I'm very happy to be part of, um, that brings compassion education to the world. Oh. In addition to that- um, that's, a new, that's a brand new role for you. Yeah, I've, I, it's, it's, it is a brand new role. So I've been doing it now for almost two months. And uh, in addition to all the other stuff I've been doing and- uh, I just absolutely love it. Nice. And then what do you do on the side? Well, it's the thing that I've been doing my whole life and I'm very uh, grateful for that. And that's um, uh, since I was about 13 years old, I've been working um, in some capacity with uh, indigenous or native American music. Um, I started that um, with Canyon records who I was with for almost 30 years, well, just over 30 years. And uh, when they ceased producing new material, they still are around and they still distribute their older material. But when they um, decided to, to not produce new material, um, myself and some of the team went over and we've established Buffalo Jump Records last year. And we're continuing that production work, um, doing the same thing. So working with some of the most brilliant and crucial voices in world culture. And they happen to come from the... Um, uh, the Native American and Indigenous communities. So we're really proud of that work, and we're very proud to be an, uh, a non-Indigenous ally to such crucial work for our planet. Exactly. And being able to just document some of that music before it can no longer be heard is really amazing. Well, yeah, and the, the best part about it is the dynamic, the amount of dynamic voices that are there. Um, and that's, um, so it's by no means going away. If anything, the voices are growing louder, louder, and louder in, in the most beautiful way. Right. And so it's really, really amazing. Um, and we're just really proud to be honored and honored to be working with them. Um, in some cases, multi general, multi generational relationships that of artists that we've worked with in communities from Northwest Mexico into Canada. So nice. just very proud of that. So. Yeah. All right. Me in Arizona. I'm just again. I just want to give a shout out to everybody. Marshall Shore. He's a gift to our state. Do what you can to support. He's just wonderful. And this is a, a huge uh, uh, honor for me, Marshall. So thank you. Oh, I mean, we had so much fun putting this together. So <laughs> we, so we always, as you, as people who have seen the show before, know that we always have the guests. They create trivia, and it is multiple choice for all 10 questions. So even if you don't know the answer, the answer is there. And then we'll take a little bit of an Arizona music break, but then we'll come back and see we'll talk about those answers and explain some of them and just wait till you hear some of the stories. <laughs> So, you know, the goal, I mean, at the end of it, we'll ask how you did. The goal is not that you get every question right, but that you walk away knowing so much more than you did when you started this evening watching a little Arizona history happy hour. So, awesome. all right. So you can keep track of either a pen and paper. You know, if you got some chocolate sauce and an, and an arm, you can keep track of your answers there. Whatever makes you happy. You go for it. 
All right. So where was Cactus, Arizona located? Was it A, Flagstaff, B, Phoenix, C, Tucson, or D, Yuma? So where do you think Cactus, Arizona was? And notice that's a past tense, was. Question two. Who were the ancient indigenous peoples that created the canal system that Phoenix grew up around and actually helped give us our name of Phoenix? Um, A, the Anasazi, B, the Hohogam, C, the Mogollon, or D, the Maricopa. What was the name given to those indigenous, indigenous folks that first created our canal system that we grew up? around. All right. Question three. What North Phoenix location is the supposed resting place of a buried UFO crash? All right. Do you think it's A, Mummy Mountain, B, Wrigley Mansion, C, Desert Ridge Mall, or D, Dreamy Draw? Which do you think is the supposed resting place of a buried UFO? All right, moving on to question four. What terrifyingly loud restaurant was located in Christown Mall? Was it A, Bill Johnson's Big Apple? B, Humpty Dumpty? C, Farrell's Ice Cream Parlor, or D, Spaghetti Benders. So what really loud eatery was located at Christown Mall and other locations as well? All right, and what strange dish was served to certain guests of this eatery? A, Whipped cream and pickle sundae. Mm -mm -mm. B, ooh, a fried banana sundae. Now we're talking like banana fosters. That sounds pretty tasty. C, a blended ketchup and whipped cream. Okay, that does not sound so tasty. Um, D, salted butter ice cream. Hmm. All right, so which do you think was the strange dish that was served at that particular Christown eatery? All right, question six. As we're coming down the hump of our questions, what prominent Native American indigenous leader ran for the U.S. presidency back in 1972? A, Ben Nighthorse Campbell, B, Russell Means, C, Floyd Westernman, or D, Philip Cascador. Which one of those folks was an indigenous leader that ran for U.S. president back in 1972? All right. What Phoenix prototype alternative group was later signed to legendary IRS records? A, Catterwall. B, Meat Puppets. C, Basic Elements. Or D, Gentlemen After Dark. So one of those is a proto alternative group that was then signed by IRS records. All right, what prize delectable grows in limited quantities only in a very select neighborhood in Phoenix? Would those be A, Black Sphinx Dates, B, Maricopa Mandarin Oranges, C, Zoltan Figs? I only hope they tell your fortune. Oh, that's Zoltar, not Zoltan. Oops. All right, D or Goldwater Grapefruit. All right, so which do you think is something that grows in a Phoenix neighborhood right now that you could enjoy? 
All right. Who opened the first recording studio in the state of Arizona? Wow. And look at this. Look at this list of all these famous people. I mean, you've got A, Lee Hazelwood, B, Marty Robbins, C, Raymond and Mary Bowley, or D, Wayne Newton. So who among those folks do you think opened up the very first recording studio in the state of Arizona? All right, and our last question. It is said that somewhere over the rainbow actually lies at the foothills of Lookout Mountain in Phoenix, Arizona. How could this be? Is it because there's a large Irish community, A, B, Gus's salvage yard, C, the strata of colors in the mountain, or D, a story of a leprechaun that lives in the mountain? All right, so why do you think people say that Lookout Mountain has somewhere over the rainbow at its foothills? All right. So while you're contemplating your answers and more than just contemplating, but locking in your final answer, we are going to talk a little bit about some Arizona music history. And so a group called the Tubes. Now, you know, if you check like the Wikipedia page for them or most other pages say they're a San Francisco based group, but you know, we know the truth. They're not as San Francisco as they pretend to be. They actually started out, um, one of the men who was in the band um, was a roadie for White Stripes and Blues Band. Um, he moved to San Francisco in the late 60s. And there was also a group called Beans. Now, if you've been around for a while... You could have seen these groups play at JD's. They also played at the Piesta Wapik Ramadas. So I guess they would have just jam sessions out in the mountains, which would have been really cool to see, um, or even at the Celebrity Theater. And so when basically Fee Waybill moved to San Francisco in the late 60s as a roadie for Red, White, and Blues, they got back, word got back to the very conservative Air Arizona about all the debauchery that was going on with this band in San Francisco. And so Beans up and moved out to San Francisco. And they quickly became, that was the origins of that band called The Tubes. Now they were kind of made famous because Early on, they brought in choreography. They had their own choreographer. They had costumes. They had big foam props they would bring on stage. And so they had very much a cult following. They also, back in 1980, were featured in the movie Xanadu, which I don't know about you, but even though everyone says it's a horrible movie, but oh my gosh. Just because of that Pan Pacific building, the fact that it's such great imagery from a building that no longer stands, as well as you get just kind of that whole mystical aspect of Olivia Newton-John back behind the scenes with Gene Kelly dancing. They had multiple albums. Their big hit came from the Outside In album, and it was called She's a Beauty, back in 1983. Now, part of the beauty of those early 80s songs was they had videos through MTV. And so there's you had Fee, who was a carnival barker. And it also gave Alexis Arquette his first acting role. He played one of the carnival writers. And it was so much fun watching them watching this video because I hadn't seen videos like that in so long that really were all about the storytelling. Oh, and Mary says she saw them at the AS Bas ASU basketball stadium when she was 12. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that's why I think it's so funny that they keep being touted as a San Francisco band when they really are 
from a conservative place like Arizona back in the 60s. All right, so who's ready for some answers? Oh my gosh, now is where the fun begins. Well, not that we're having not having fun already. So, <laughs> all right. So where was Cactus Arizona located? And it was B Phoenix. So where, so Stephen, where was Cactus Arizona? Cactus Arizona was uh, at about 32nd Street in Cave Creek. Uh, well, excuse me, um, not 32nd Street. Thunderbird. It's that part where Cactus becomes Thunderbird. Oh, where yeah. In Cave Creek. That was where the post office used to be. And I think there's a picture of the post office. And, you know, it used to all be my my father and the late Jack Miller, an Arizona legend who will who you've you've touched upon it on previous shows. And no doubt you can't talk about Arizona music without Jack Miller. But he used to tell me that that they used to drive in the desert in that area and they would drive to the post office. It was all just desert dirt roads, pretty much like the picture. But okay. yeah, I went to preschool in that area. So some, you know, if I really want to impress people, I can say, well, I attended preschool in Cactus. <laughs> it just wasn't Cactus anymore. <laughs> right. <laughs> Not nice. preschool, I say daycare. I went to daycare in Cactus. Aww. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but yeah, and evidently there... Evidently, there's some people who still remember that. So, you know, 85032 is the zip. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure the Sunny Slip Historical Society probably has a huge file folder full <laughs> of information about Cactus, Arizona. That's right. Well, and that's where we get Cactus Road. Right. Was, I mean, I'm so, I'm so excited that museums and things are kind of opening back up again. And even small museums like the Science of Historical Society, it's like saying, oh, I have to go look and see when they're when they open up again, because I miss those small little archives. For yes. So much goodness. There's some good ones. You could do a whole show on Sunny Slope. Sunny Slope. Oh, great. completely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, you've got Monkey Mountain and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. Dr. Hall. Yeah, the so cornucopia. Oh, that's a good idea. I should reach out to them and say, "Hey, now that you guys are yeah. open, we should do an entire show on Sunny Slope." Because yeah. yeah, that's a good. That's a great, great part of town. Yeah, no, it's it's amazing to think that it was Cactus and Sunny Slope just down the road. There you go. All right, and who were the ancient indigenous peoples that created the canal system that Phoenix grew up around? And it was B, the Hohogam. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, we, we living in the desert, we are indebted to this. This was the, this community that, um, they, they, most people believe they could have been thriving as early as two thousand or well, long ago, but as early as 2000 BC, right. but their irrigation canals, um, are, are the foundation of us living in the desert. Finding a way to bring water here is just the fundamental gift and legacy of these in, original inhabitants of our lands. Um, yeah, I think w when I read that it was almost, I think it was 100,000 acres plus that they were able to irrigate with that system of canals. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Um, I, I shouldn't say unbelievable. It's fully believable. It's just so amazing. Yeah, and look at those. Yeah. I mean, and, and to think, you know, we, we rode our bikes along those and that's where we get our water. And it's just, you know, that's, that's a, a, just a huge legacy that's been bequeathed to the people of Phoenix. So, so there's actually, so actually I'm going to throw this up because um, my friend, he was like, Oh, it's ho ho -com. Um, Kind of the newer word. I mean, they kind of mean the same group of folks, but a lot of folks are now starting to refer to them more as a hogum. Yeah, that absolutely. And, you know, obviously we had the Hohokam Expressway, which was, you know, if you listen to a traffic report in the 70s in Phoenix, they always talked, well, the Hohokam Expressway is a bit backed up, you know. So Hohokam was like the way we learned how to say it when we were younger. And yeah, they absolutely they, they, This is part of the general education that we're all going through in terms of really understanding the contribution, the identification, and the correct, authentic understandings of the original inhabitants of, of North America.
So then did you ever ski in the canals? I've heard stories about how people would pull people behind their cars as they would ski the canal. No, sadly, I, I didn't hear about that. I, I, I remember people talking about envisioning again, you know, that they could skateboard in it. And there were people who said, well, I skated in it at this area that was drained. And I never knew anybody who did. Sadly, I just saw all the people who were throwing trash in there. So, but uh, I, yeah, but you know, I love the fact that I've got family members who ride, you know, they ride their bikes along that canal. It just makes me feel good. It's the life. Oh yeah, no, I, I love the whole. I mean, that it's like. I mean, it's like in Scottsdale they've developed the canal space. You've yeah. got um, Phoenix is trying to do the whole beautify the canal space. So yeah, so I, I think it's it's great to see people are taking what at one point I think was more of a detraction, and making it beautiful and more of a destination. Exactly. That and that's the way it should be because it's really it's, it's just the lifeblood. It's something to celebrate. It should be a rallying point. What right. I mean be? that. Yeah. I mean that's the whole reason why we are named Phoenix is because Daryl Dupa, when he saw this, that it was another civilization that we were rising out of. He was like, Phoenix is a is a great name because of that bird rising up from another civilization. Yeah. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Yeah. We should be mindful of it all the time. Oh my gosh. And then from, from the sublime to the. <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> what North Phoenix location is supposed resting place of a buried UFO crash. And it is D dreamy draw. Dreamy. Th okay. This just, so I grew up near the dreamy draw. So like dreamy draw just comes out of our mouths. Like pfft. it's the dreamy draw, you know, I mean, we played there when we were kids and this is again, before, they established it as a park before the the 51 was there. The Dreamy Draw used to be this like this dark corridor connecting Central Phoenix to the emerging communities that were North Phoenix. And we used to tell our, our relatives when they would drive in, you're going to think you're going into the middle of the desert, but just keep going and then you'll find us on the other side. It was just dark and isolated. So I guess that makes sense that it gave rise. And then of course, where's the water? There's a dam. Where's the water that gave rise to the notion of there's, there's right. a UFO buried there. Right. So, yeah. So, I mean, there, there's that whole kind of conspiracy that the, there's a UFO buried under the dam and that's why there's even a dam there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and then I, so nearby there, I, first of all, the name dreamy draw was, you know, I had no idea. We just thought dreamy is in like, just a dreamy, oh, but not dreamy, like, like Arizona day, just a dreamy Arizona. Oh, but day. not mercury mines no. and driving people crazy. Yeah, exactly. And then of course I had friends who went to nearby school at mercury mine. And I'm like, well, that's, I thought of it as this great place. And of course there are tons of mines in those mountains there. They're all, you know, attempt, attempted mines. They were beginning mines that kids would go in and, they're all filled up now, but, uh, you know, so I had no idea about this, you know, cinnabar and the mercury and all that. I mean, just unbelievable. So mysterious nonetheless. Right. And, you know, if you go up, um, up on old route 66 is a little town called Yucca and they have what they are calling the area 66 museum that talks about a nearby in Kingman a UFO crash landing very similar to um, Roswell, New Mexico. Wow. I didn't know that. So, That's yeah. So it's like, so I've not been able to get up there now, now that COVID's over, maybe I can actually get up there to the museum. Cause I'm intrigued to see what it is. And well, so. we, had, we had lots of space. So, I mean, meaning like, like empty space to land. We definitely had space to land. So right. Chances are, they they pick the biggest runway, the widest runway, <laughs> and the desert would make a great runway. If you if I was trying to land a UFO, that's where I would land. Totally, exactly. <laughs> oh my gosh! All right. So, question four: What terrifyingly loud eatery was located in Chris Town? Feral. Some Ferrell's ice cream. So, you yeah. know, after some people have talked about Ferrell's, no one's ever talked about the noise. So, Stephen, tell me about the noise okay. that was created at Ferrell's. 
and, th- and I, I've checked this with family members. They definitely remember it. Is uh, I think the word I heard most recently from my mother was I can't remember. It was insane levels of noise. She said it was just, and it was like I remember being in one part of Chris Town and echoing down the long pass, you know, the long corridor of Chris Town Mall. You'd hear this. Dun, 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 dun. It was just intense and it was fierce. It was like, um, yeah, it was like Burning Man before Burning Man. It just levels of intensity. (laughs) I I love that Farrell's ice cream has now be equated to Burning Man. (laughs) In my, I'll I'll tell you, my my friends who grew up in Phoenix with me, they had the same like visceral reaction to the volume. It was just like, I mean, it was obviously fun. Like it was like a you know, a moth to a flame, you wanted to go there, but you know, you get too close, you get burned. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> it was just, I remember the ferocity of the noise. Um, it was really impressive. <laughs> I like how you're using impressive now as like a negative term, but <laughs> going to create a whole new vernacular. I know. Well, it, it, I think what was great too, was to find out like, you know, how beloved a place it was. I, again, you know, you grew up in Phoenix, you're like, well, something's in Phoenix that this is the only place it ever is. So I didn't know that there were ferals, let alone, I didn't even know there was one over at Scottsdale, let alone, know, let alone. Oh. I, did. I just thought of Chris town and I just got to give a shout out to the little digital building next to it. One of my favorite buildings. Oh, the Phoenix. IBM punch card or not the IBM punch card building. This is on the end. Oh. yeah. So classic, but I mean, let's look at the guy's face. It's intense. It it is. I mean, put a red nose and people would be terrified of him. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know everybody has good memories, and and maybe I just am having memory envy. I don't know. Well, and then Mary says that all three of her brothers worked at Farrell's. Oh, see, that must have been an awesome job. Honestly, that must have been an amazing job because that was flair. Before flair, before your servers and your right. food delivery was like dynamic, Farrell's was nailing it. That, that must have been fun. Oh, and they also have then just Chris Town Mall, well, which they, which they want to go through and do a kind of a big redevelopment of Chris yeah. Town, which I is threw, interesting. Yeah, I mean, it was a great mall, and I threw these up there because I thought. I, when I look at these pictures, I just imagine the sound of ferals echoing down the, the way. So that's why I was like, well, that's what, that's what I think of. I like how not even the sandcastles could absorb all the bombastic sound coming out of ferals. <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, that's awesome. All right. And they also had a really strange dish. I, that I, was a whipped cream and pickle Sunday. Yes. I, I confirmed this with somebody very close to me. They were there and they were pregnant. And they was were it your mom. Um I, I my mom asked not to be identified. Okay, so okay, we won't identify the person then. It's, okay. It's the it's the artist formerly known as my mom. <laughs> Well, she. Does, I don't think she's watching because she's not chiming in going, what? You mentioned me. So, okay. <laughs> but yeah, if you're pregnant, um, but evidently too, I found out Farrell's, that was like a big thing. Like pickles were a big thing there too. That They were like known for like pickles and pickle. Evidently there's a whole whipped cream pickle challenge on, on social media now. So something happened there, but maybe it started at Farrell's at Christown. <laughs> I like how you're equating viral videos yeah. like Tide Pods now to Ferrell's yes. and everyone wanting to have a whipped cream pickle, something deliciousness or not so delicious. As I know. Are. Google it. I was surprised when I was researching this. I was like, oh my gosh, are people doing this? They're like filming themselves doing the pickle whipped cream challenge. So. You know, I know my friend Mia loves pickles. I should ask her if she's done the pickle whipped cream challenge. (laughs) Although I have a feeling she's going to say yes. And then I'll be kind of disappointed. But (laughs) 
All right. And, oh my gosh. Okay. So what prominent Native American indigenous leader ran for the U.S. presidency back in 1972? Yeah, Philip, the late, great Philip Casador. Um, he, uh, again, going up at Canyon Records and around this, this was a name I heard at a very young age, and um, I never got to meet him. Um, he passed away in 1985, far too, too early, um, but he kind of lived a few lifetimes in that period. He ran a, uh, an Apache language radio um show out of globe wow. um, he recorded tons with canyon records um he was performing he and his sister late patsy casador or, or uh, matt um she later remarried she was patsy matt um and they, they were just real real advocates and that was why late philip ran for the presidency was simply to raise awareness of the issues of Native Americans. And I think that I just really, as I get older, I really understand what was required to do that. I have tremendous respect for that. It was on the Geronimo party ticket, I believe. And, um, you know, I, I believe he, he was, he even approached Muhammad Ali to be his, his replacement, so to speak, when he backed out. Cause I think wow. he, was really, yeah, he was there to really just elevate the dialogue. So it was activism before it was activism in many ways. It was a very skillful way of, of that. I really, um, yeah. And I just have to say he was a tremendously gifted singer. Um, his father, the late Murphy Casa was a, a tremendous knowledge holder and elder um, of the San, Car San Carlos Apache, and he he just was inheritor, and he, he and his sister to, um, you know, a, a centuries old singing tradition, knowledge traditions. Wow! And then the fact that he actually had then an, a, the radio program. Yeah, it, it, great is, is amazing. Yeah. So was so was that recorded as well? I don't know of it being recorded, but my okay. Because I was wondering if if maybe. As, as we get to a later question, if that comes up, but I was like, oh, wow. It would be a good question because I know having gone through in my time with Jack Miller at Canyon, going through the archives, we found recordings from radio stations that were, again, just there for demo purposes and stuff like that. My gut, knowing Philip, Philip was a documentarian. He was very aware of the power of recording and com communicating that way for his people. But I think he really saw, now this is my voice, just because of the sheer amount of recording he did is really unique for that time period. Yeah, I mean, no, very, yeah, really that's crazy. pretty amazing. Yeah. What an, what an enlightened human being. Yeah, and I think, um, yeah, he was just an innovator that way. He just a pioneer, really amazing. Yeah. And his stuff is still available. You can stream. That's the great thing about this. You can stream him on Spotify. Wow. Okay. So hold on. We're going to go back to him so everybody can look him up. And yeah. so they can now go back and listen to a 1972 presidential candidate. Yeah. 1972. Yeah. The album on the left, uh, Apache with his sister is you can stream that right now on on your favorite streaming platform. Please do. You'll be better for it. Oh my gosh, I had no idea. How cool is that? <laughs> yeah, really amazing stuff. Wow. All right. So question seven. It'll be interesting to see who got this right because there were some some red herrings kind of in the mix of those answers. Yeah. So. What Phoenix prototype alternative group was later signed to legendary IRS records? And it would be a Catterwall. Yeah. They, they, she, totally under, under appreciate. I shouldn't say underappreciated because pretty much anybody you come across who knows them, loves them, really gets them. It was just, they're not as well known, but they, um, yeah, I believe. Some of them went to Chaparral High School. Don't quote me. I'm pretty sure. Wow, Chaparral was um, a lot of musicians. It's like, yeah, I know. A lot of crazy elements comes from, and so wow. Well, basic elements was Shadow Mountain, but basic oh. elements. Oh, 
they were connected to Catterwall, and that's how I met them. How how I became uh, okay. The great thing about Catterwall is they like predated. Now I'm going to geek out a little bit in music, but they predated the kind of hard rock gothic post-punk mix that became Jane's Addiction, I feel, this is my view, they were doing that a few years earlier. And it's no no coincidence wow. that when they relocated out to LA, they did shows with people like Jane's Addiction. But you know, they you could hear Led Zeppelin in there, you could hear the Cocteau Twins, you could hear a little bit of early Pink Floyd, you could hear other post-punk stuff as well. It really, amazing band and then they got signed by irs they did two brilliant records with irs records but um really great yeah really really good band and the video uh for a flower and a stone which you see the still there is this beautifully filmed and hand colorized video that they did on their own i mean it took a long time to make it's an amazing oh. video for a quote-unquote local band it's just groundbreaking for a local band to do a video like that especially when you think at the time it was done which was like 86 or something like that brilliant right. Check it out. caterwall i still listen I, to them today. and i and i bet because of the albums you can probably even find them on spotify or Some of them, itunes or yeah, the irs ones you can the the earlier yeah. ones the ones above it you can't but i listened to i lit in preparation for this i listened to the whole album pin and web today so i love them, <laughs> love them. Nice. thank you basic <laughs> elements for sharing uh caterwall you know i actually I, mean, I actually talked to someone from basic elements and we've actually talked about maybe having them on as a guest of the show that that's a cool story and, and, and too because they were there's just a cool scene that was going on with like all these kids in the desert who like were listening yeah. to Brit british bands and were like what's more opposite than the desert it's like, well, that was interesting British about like, 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 it's like, you know, I didn't realize, I mean, I always, I didn't realize the tubes had started so early as they did. I didn't yeah. realize they were so groundbreaking in so many ways. And I think they, and the, as they said, a lot of that came because they were in the desert where it was like, they were kind of segregated away from what was going on. So they just ramped everything up and they grew up watching Walsh and Ladmo. I mean, all these tongue, I mean, very tongue in cheek things. So I think yeah. you're right. You know, there's the PhD thesis is like, how did there's something going on here? Because there are great bands that came out of the desert. And I think the isolation was a factor. And I, as one friend of mine said years later, when, when we were getting older and some of us were in bands and they were moving on and they said, Phoenix is a great place to explore your identity. Like the, the Arizona, Tucson as well, because Tucson's oh. got the, the notion that you can create, build and imagine a life may have been a conduit. Whereas if you were in a different area, you may not have had as many, you may not have had to have relied on your own imagination as much. So that, I don't know. You know, I mean, that, I think that is so interesting because it's like one of the things I always talk about is the fact that so many people came to Phoenix from elsewhere to reinvent themselves. Well, and, you know. and so what's interesting is like, so here you have people who are really reinvent themselves, even though they were here. It's like, well, you know, because th it was such a small place, you could become someone else quite quickly. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that is so fascinating that it wasn't just entrepreneurial wise, but also music wise. Yeah, great. So I, 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 you've just like jumped a spark there for me. I'm like, oh my gosh. This is the stuff I sit around and I mean, Marshall, this is what I do with my free time. I just, well, yeah, no, I mean, cause you have like the whole Ziggy's records and how that, yeah. I mean, I mean, the, 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 the yeah. basically the twang heard around the world. I mean, the fact that it's yeah. like so much has come from little old Arizona that. Well, and, and, I, and I'm going to give another shout out here. Not many people know this. Um, I'm going to absolutely say it. I'll find the article for you, but. There is a cool thing that happened here. Uh, so Jack Miller, the twang around the world was invented in collaboration with Jack Miller and Lee Hazelwood. Johnny Dixon will tell you the whole story. Right. Finding this water tank and creating this massive reverb. Well, the band Joy Division in 78, 79 yeah. was produced by legendary producer Martin Hannett in an interview. If you listen to those records, he had tons of reverb on everything. And if you listen to him, he was going through his his effects rack and he says, well, you know, we didn't have access to a water tank. And isn't that beautiful that Martin Hannett was putting layering reverb on Joy Division 
and referencing something that happened in Phoenix, this homegrown musical innovation. So, wow, all my goth friends would be going yeah. nuts right now over that. It's, I'm gonna be sure and call them. It's true, go find the Martin Hannon interview. He talks about it. It's it's definitely the water tank from, from uh, Dwayne Eddy Records. That is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So question eight, what prize delectable grows in limited quantities only in a very select particular neighborhood in Phoenix? There it is. Black Sphinx dates. Now, Marshall, you probably know more about this than I do. I just know that. Well, you, well, we know different things. We, I mean, yeah. as we've talked. We could. So I know, I know that. They were brought over by the government from the Middle East, I think like in the 10s or the 20s. Well, like, so, for, so from what I heard, they actually were kind of a hybrid. It's actually, okay. there were so many people here kind of experimenting with, um, like you have the Diller Orange, which is now the Arizona Sweet. That was mm. a hybrid. The Black Sphinx Date, I think, is actually a hybrid of a couple different species of dates kind of coming together. Gotcha. So that's yeah. why this is the only place where they grow is because this is where they were put together. Well, and I heard other stories where they talked about like the, the actual source trees from the Middle East like are gone. So like the 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 grove oh, that they oh, came oh, from, like oh. the mother trees are gone. And that's I've heard again, who knows? It's it 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 could get a little Star Wars, like the lineage is. Wow, well, you know, I wonder. If, it's like you know, I mean, I had a friend Monica who was like a, like a food kind of historian. It's like ah, dang. It's like I wonder if there's like another Arizona food historian. I, 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 I okay, I need to track somebody down who can talk about. What What's great is I I have a phone number in my phone with a person's name and their last name is Dates. And my family and I have called that person and we've met them in the neighborhood because they have access to the cherry picker and we buy them out of the back of their car. It's a little bit like a Miami Vice episode, but we're buying. I, I know I'm kind of like, it's like, do they like roll their sleeves up and do they come in like little baggies? That's what, it was, that's what it was like. I felt, I was like, wow, I'm really on the in, in club right now buying these dates on the darkened corner in Arcadia. Wow. <laughs> Anyways, they're mysterious, you know, land of mystery. And indeed. And yes, and the Black Sphinx dates are are famous for growing only in Arcadia. Well, and I will say I'm not a date connoisseur, but um I've heard people say that they really there is something truly special about them. Like they are very unique flavor-wise. So mm, I guess I, I might be needing that number with Mr. <laughs> date. <laughs> So that way I can make a midnight drop. <laughs> we'll talk offline. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yeah. So, yeah. And so, so also what's happening with these dates is as the trees get older and grow up, they're now getting into the power line. So I know a few years ago, it was a huge issue in terms of do, wow. do we cut off the heads of the date palms or change where the wires grow so that they actually and so i don't know what they resolved wow good question jeez oh so, yeah so i have to go back and figure and talk to somebody in arcadia and wow. and they, they were really upset i mean there was a one point where they wouldn't let me in a meeting because they didn't know who i was wow. they thought i was like some mole trying to find out what their plans were and I'm like, no, I'm actually here to save them as well. Cause I think it's an important thing that we save our agricultural history. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Brilliant. I mean, that's the thing we, we need to preserve these spaces. We need to preserve what grows there. Yeah, exactly. All right. So, oh my gosh, this is going to be such a fun question. So who opened up the first recording studio in the state of Arizona? Yep. Uh, Raymond and Mary Bowley, married couple, um, and Ray's on the left with his hand on this, uh, in this fabulous, uh, very posed shot. Of <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, that's Raymond and his wife, Mary, and they, and they, they opened uh, Arizona Recording Productions, and it was the first studio that was opened. Um, they, uh, 
in the entire state. And they eventually, like, as you see, they, they did work with Marty Robbins. Um, again, I'll, I'll speak from what I was told to me, Johnny D and other people who know more may, may know more, but my understanding from what Ray told me, I was very, I grew up with Ray and Mary. So, um, I had a close connection with them and then I ended and eventually worked for them at Canyon records, um, as a child. Um, Marty Robbins still was not touring. He, he was still at a budding time in his career, but he was a great songwriter. So he was still coming back to Phoenix. And in some time cases, he had a job. And my understanding is he was working downtown and he would come over sometimes on his lunch breaks to the studio and he would record copyright versions of his songs. Um, so they weren't for public release, but he was documenting them to get copyright registered. And that was how Ray recorded Marty Robbins. Uh, to this day, I haven't found anything that was commercially released, but he worked with him in that collaborative way because it was like home, homegrown studio. And then the other picture uh, there of, of the Newton Rascals of Wayne, young Wayne Newton, um, they did yeah. record stuff with him, um, and that was commercially released. Really? Yeah. Oh, so, I had no idea they actually recorded things. I mean, because I mean, well, we have the whole um, Lou King of the Rangers. Yeah. yeah. So there's some some good recordings. Not too many, but there's a few out there. I was going to say, I mean, I didn't realize there were any. So that's kind yeah. of surprising. Yeah. And they're publicly released. I know Bear Family in Germany has a compilation with some of their stuff on it. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense but, that they would have them, right? Yeah. But um, again, um, yeah, just amazing, you know, and and then eventually in 1951, while they had a film business, because um, they were doing films at the time as well, they, the gentleman, the Ed Linate, the, the Dene or Navajo singer who was with Ray in the previous shot, they heard him, um, uh, he was asked to record him um, for a production of the Phoenix Little Theater. And it was through that that they met and Ray Boley fell in love with his voice. Ed Linate as oh, said. I never realized it was through a connection with Phoenix Little Theater. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was, uh, I think there oh. were two, two songs that were, were to be recorded for the theater. And then through a conversation, they really hit it off. And Ed said, you know, a lot of these songs kind of reside with me. You know, he brought up the notion of the impermanence of the songs. and. That was when Ray said, well, let's record them. So Ray and Mary recorded them. They sold them at the Arizona State Fair in 1951. They sold out of all the records. Um, and there was a Hopi jeweler set up next to them. And the Hopi jeweler said, you should come up and record some of our music. And that was the second recording in the Canyon catalog. And it started from that. Yeah. Now, I also think they did the first stereo recording in Arizona. That's probably so, true. So, I, so um, it was Song of the Sun Suite, which was by Fruita Grofe. Mm. And it was played by, um, originally it was actually played by high school students, but then the ASU Orchestra played it. And mm. they were playing it for two different radio stations and one mic was on each side. So they decided they would record each. Oh, wow. And so you actually, they got, so they had the first stereo recording done in Arizona because of those two radio stations. Amazing. That's, so, I, I didn't know that. That's brilliant. Wow. Wow. Well, it's, it's been a pleasure to grow up in that household. And I can only imagine. Oh my yeah. gosh. Well, and then yeah. Oh, and then another oh my gosh. Question. Another oh my gosh. Yeah. So what said that somewhere over the rainbow actually lies the foothills of Lookout Mountain in Phoenix, Arizona. How can that be? Oh yeah. Gus. Oh Gus. I know. I I I I, I could shed a tear talking about Gus. Like he's impacted my life in, in the strangest ways. You know, you, Marshall, you and I were talking about him. And, you know, we, we grew up in that general neighborhood, like around off of Cape Creek Road near Lookout Mountain. And, you know, we just heard rumors about this quirky guy who had this like, almost like this compound. And there was all sorts of interesting stuff there. And, you know, when you hear that as a kid, you, you go into, Boo Radley 
fantasies of like, well, it's the unknown thing. And so we would go and like peek around and look and, you know, we were certain that there was something really unbelievable going on. And then years later, we had enough gumption to walk up in, in the daylight and we met Gus and he gave us a tour of this property. It was a huge lesson for me to, you, you see, like To Kill a Mockingbird, you, you see your Boo Radleys may be the biggest gifts to your community. Um, and uh, Gus was just that. And it was uh, when I got older and older and, and, and learned a lot about him talking to you, Marshall. And uh, you know, I found out he passed away in 2013 and he was like about 89. And um, he just really loved this. This was a gift to the community. And, right. and I just, it's just deeply moving. It's really emotional for me to think back on that time. So. Yeah, I mean, what Gus was really doing was, I mean, so his family, he was talking about, I guess they bought a huge plot of land right after the depression hit. Mm -hmm. And so everyone said they were crazy. And so he started going downtown and as they were demolishing things, he would then go down and salvage things. So there was a white bank downtown that had white bricks. And so he had a planter built out of white bricks. He had a medallion from the Fox theater that he went and got as they were tearing it down. And so it was, he had such an appreciation for telling these stories of Phoenix that, I mean, I met him early. I mean, I was still with a library at that point. And so it was really influential and just kind of, Oh, you, it's just by having this little concrete piece, you can tell a whole story about a theater that was an amazing art deco theater that no longer stands. Yeah. Um, and also finding out that his family didn't appreciate what he did. I mean, he had, he had, um, so it was so funny. The end of his street was a cul-de-sac and you would actually yeah. just drive up over the sidewalk into his driveway. It's like, cause it's not really a cul-de-sac. It just looks like one. And he was such a fascinating character. I mean, every time you would go on a tour, um, he also had mentioned how that little area of land was, he had thought was Montgomery, Arizona, which was a little tiny town back in the day. Wow. I wouldn't be surprised uh, about that. You know, I mean. I mean, because there, there were some old buildings that yeah, were there. Exactly. I mean. So, yeah. And then when he passed away, it's like I went up actually after the day after he had passed away, not knowing that. And the gate was locked and I was like, oh, that's not good. And I'm and, and he had always said that as soon as he passed away, his family was going to scrape and toss all of his treasures. I mean, he had diving bells that they would take and put people in and go down into mines. Wow. Um, huge pieces of petrified wood that he had gotten in the 30s. See, that's so old school Arizona, like that kind of mindset, that living, like there was like an appreciation. I mean, we, you know, we grew up with petrified wood. Like if we had petrified wood. We put it out as a, as a piece of honor in our yard. Right. Like, and, that's yes. old school Arizona, like especially right. down in the Sonoran desert part of it. So, right. you know, yeah. Um, oh, it's just, I, and I had other friends who it was the same thing. You know, I remember when we met him, they were like, you bet him? You, oh my gosh, you went up? You weren't afraid? And I was like, well, yeah, but, you know. Well, then he, and then he did this whole thing where it was like, I mean, so I think from when you met him to when I met him, it was like, he would be like, well, you know, this planter made out of white bricks is not enough. It needs to be a sphinx. So he would mm. bring in an artist that then would concrete, through a concrete artist that would then create this sphinx as a planter for this crested cactus. I mean, he created, he had a whole collection of anomalies out in the desert. Wow. And so, yeah. I mean, Gus was such a super special guy. Wow. Jeez. I mean, and I, think his, and I think his father was like the manager or caretaker of the building for the lions in Phoenix. Oh. Well, and I still remember when that neighborhood developed out there. I mean, he really was out on his own in the late 70s, early 80s. I can still remember when the first track of homes went out from Cave Creek Road out to there. So he was 
able to develop and 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 live this life and and then eventually i remember there were homes right kind of abutting him like from a development and right, right. The and stuff so yeah yeah that's the lesson i learned i mean he not only like the beauty of it the fact that like he was so pure arizona but just your boo radleys aren't boo radleys you're you're they're they're huge gifts and and i still i spoke to a friend about gus yesterday and I texted somebody about that, about showing up and being a guest on your program, and and he was somebody as a kid who went out to Gus's, and he's like Gus, you know. So there we go. There's a little bit of a legacy. We're better. In, for indeed, there is. All right. So I know some people have already been saying how they've done. Um, th we've got three out of ten, five out of, and you know. Again, it's not how many you got right, but look at all the fun we had with some of these amazing stories. <laughs> I hope I didn't go on too long, Marshall. No, not at all. I mean, I, I mean, no, I mean, they were amazing stories. I mean, and Jeff got five out of five, which I think, you know, that's really good. That is. Yeah. But, you know, if you're to do the whole like pre-test, post-test, I have a feeling people would do a lot better if we did that same test now. Yeah. Yeah. Because well, some of good so stories, I mean. I learned so much too, Marshall. This, this has been great for me too, prepping for it and learning from you. I mean, it's just brilliant. This is what it's about. So exactly. it's all about having fun and just sharing our love of Arizona. Yeah, for sure. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing some of your passion in life. Thank you, Marshall. I'm going to give a quick shout out to my friend here behind me, Arizona artist, Jeremy Singer from the Diné Nation, Mutton Art ah. Studio. There, so he's a good friend and I've worked with him and my family uh, loves, um, loves his artwork. So shout out to G Arizona artist, Jeremy Singer. All right. Very good. So thank you so thank much. You, Have a great rest of your evening and I will talk to you soon. Sounds good, Marshall. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for having me here. Oh my gosh. You know, that was, <laughs> you know, as we were talking through some of these questions, it was like, we could have gone on for probably another hour. So thank you all so much. Um, so now we move on to the story or the show and tell. And it's so actually I'm talking to Steven about this as well. So since we were doing music, I thought, so here is, it's called a brand new day. And so it is actually an album that was created by the Brophy Men's Club. And it is some of the local pastors at Brophy now singing um, in a very folksy tone, as you can tell by we have oh, the guitar player. Um, since I don't have a record player, he said it sounded very much like what you would expect, almost like the Kingston Trio, but singing a variety of Psalms of the Day or Palms of the Day. Um, one of the things I found fascinating is, is that Jack Miller, whose name came up, was actually the producer on this record. Um, that amazing, really kind of cool image on the front was taken by James Duke of Duke Photography. Which I know that building has been in the press a lot lately about the community trying to figure out what to do. That it's been sold to become a chicken restaurant. And so the community is trying to figure out is in a quandary about what to do about that. So I'm sure we'll have more information on that as the night goes on. So I do want to say thank you all for joining us now next week. Oh my gosh. It's going to be a really fun week as well. So we have Jack Reed who is up at NAU. And so he is, he's going to be talking about hitchhiking history of Arizona, as well as, um, black history community black community history up in the northern arizona area as well so it's going to be an amazing show as we talk about you know i've already had conversations with my mom about one of her brothers who did a lot of hitchhiking so it's going to be a fun show and i think people will be surprised by how much hitchhiking history is right here in arizona i know i sure was so now, remember, if you would like to make comments, if you didn't do so in the chat session, please feel free to reach out to me on Facebook, Instagram, or email. Those are great ways to reach out. Maybe you have some story ideas. 
You know, I think we came up with a couple up here. I mean, I think reaching out to the Sunny Slip Museum now that small museum is starting to open up again is a great idea. Um, I always love to give a shout out to Colin Travis, who did that intro video for the program, as well as PJ Vader Baron, my cocktail advisor, or as he probably would say, an ambassador. And so this evening, I'm leaving you with Mr. Ho Orgestratica as we get a chance to listen to a hometown Sunny Slope boy who now is on the East Coast with his own orchestra. So it's also then set to found film footage. Um, some of that is from Library of Congress. Some of that is from my very own collection. So thank you all so much for joining us. Have a great rest of your evening and a great, amazing night. Oh, 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 oh,